All right, welcome back to another edition of FBC Extra. We've been working our way through the gender discussion with our Minister of Students, Reed Hernandez, and I'm glad to say he's back. In our first episode, we talked a lot about what the crisis was, what the problem was, where it stems from, and then last week we looked at what the Bible has to say, what Scripture has to say, and what the Lord himself would say. What do we do with all that? Hmm. Because inevitably, as we look at the culture around us, like we've talked about, it's seeped into absolutely everything that we have, you know, movies, shows, culture, social media is dictating so many things, and it's coming. I don't think I'm wrong in saying that as a church, we're inevitably going to hit this. This is going to come up in a lot of different ways. I mean, obviously, we're all in the secular world to some extent. Most of us have jobs and friends and neighbors mm-hmm. and all these things. And so we're all going to hit it mm-hmm. in that sense. Mm-hmm. But I'm also at some point as a church in our lifetime, there's going to be a time where I think we're going and, and truly, I think we're, we're going to have to step up. I mean, we've had to step up on marriage. We've had to step up on divorce and, and homosexuality and all mm-hmm. those things. I mean, we faced that as a church before. Mm-hmm. I think the day is coming where... Mm-hmm we will have to defend. Mm. And I think it's important that we're able to do that. So Reed, I'm glad you're here again. I know that you have done this. You know, you have had conversations about this issue and I'm sure you'll have many, many more if you're a youth pastor here for any (laughs) length of time. So someone who's gone through a little bit of that and obviously you've done the reading and you have the counseling background. Mm. I want to look at it two different ways, maybe three different ways. Mm. We'll start with all of us are going to run into unbelievers. Mm-hmm. We're going to be faced with what we talked about last week of it's going to come down to our conscience because if we affirm their transgender side of the coin, then we're lying about the reality of how they've been created. So mm-hmm. now we have a problem like we mm-hmm. talked about. So we're going to have to decide how we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to, okay, we have a friend. They're telling me I know they're a man and now they're saying they're a woman, mm-hmm. surgery or not. Mm-hmm. How do we approach that? Yeah. I think one of my just lifeline verses for this issue is Jude verses 22 and 23. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Those verses are so vivid because it's telling us what's at stake in this. As if we need to be even more intimidated, right? Right, right, right. Jude is saying that we as Christians are like firefighters running into the blaze. I mean, we are running into a burning building just trying to grab people by their garment, you know, and pull them out of this fire that they have found themselves in. And I think, number one, you have mercy on those who waver. Like, we should feel a heartfelt sympathy and compassion for people that struggle in these ways because it's lostness and brokenness at its core. So our disposition immediately towards somebody who is struggling is we just have a a gut-level heaviness in our hearts for them because they are laboring under the the brokenness of their sin nature that has both warped their their mind and perhaps their body. And so, you know, the stance that we approach them out of is one of compassion and concern and and empathy. But that doesn't mean that we compromise either. And so we uphold from that stance of compassion and care, God's good and better design for them, right? So I think that's the starting point for anybody that comes to us. So then we can imagine ourselves saying, okay, well, what if, um, you know, what if a friend comes to me from my job and, you know, they are not a Christian, I can tell that right away. You know, how do I sort of approach them about this? Maybe they bring it up in conversation and say like, hey, I'm really feeling like I'm, you know, this other sort of identity or this other gender that I'm now exploring. You know, I think, I mean, just ask questions. Mm-hmm. You know, I, there's never anything wrong with asking a question. We feel sometimes so much that we've got to get our script out there. Right, we've got to yeah. hit all five points or else we fail. You know, I think you just ask questions to that individual and you say, well, how'd you sort of get to that point? Is there anything in your life that like has led you to start to, to feel in this way? And do you feel like if you go down this path that this will bring you lasting lasting happiness and just explore with them. I mean, that's what counselors call exploration. You're just digging for details. You're taking a genuine care and concern about their lives. And then I think based on the answers that they're giving you, you are probably going to sense that something else or other things have been the issues in their lives. I liken the gender issue, especially for those that are really struggling and suffering as an iceberg. An individual that is struggling with their gender identity is statistically just guaranteed to already be struggling with things like anxiety, depression, some sort of dissatisfaction with a feature of their own body, their anatomy, just bodily insecurity, feeling alone or feeling isolated or different from others. Those are virtually guaranteed to already be issues in that person's life. 
And so if the gender expression and the gender exploration in that person's life is the iceberg above the water, then all of the other social anxiety, previous issues of depression, previous feelings and current feelings of being alone or misunderstood or just not having another person, those are the deeper issues there. And our world just sees, well, the top of the iceberg is, you know, you adopting an LGBTQ plus identity. Beneath the iceberg is it's your true authentic self. Where actually, if we're rightly understanding where all this is coming from, that person that's approaching you about this probably has a handful of other mental health struggles going on. And so that's where you have to play the long game with them. Conversation one, the Lord leads you to get it all out there. Speak God's design. There will never be anything wrong or untrue about that. Okay. But understand that in the life of somebody that comes to you, especially if it's not a Christian, there are a whole lot of other issues going on on the underneath portion of the iceberg of their lives. If those issues are taken care of and are nurtured and are aimed at good and godly things to help them flourish and not at self-centered things or worldly or sinful things that are going to cause them even more harm or damage, that actually can work its way from the bottom up. So the way that I think somebody who feels gender confused and doesn't like it, okay, that's the operative term there. Because if somebody's gender confused and they they have no qualms about it, then there's no amount of counseling or therapy that will change their mind, right? Counseling and therapy works when somebody's motivated to change. If somebody says, hey, I feel this way and I'm struggling with this, can you help me? Is there anything available for me out there? Okay, that's where I think a wise pastoral counselor, biblical counselor, Christian counselor will say, let's explore these other issues going on in your life where very clearly, not just your gender, seems to be the issue, but your self-conception, what you believe about yourself, the other factors going on in your life with your relationships and maybe some hardship that's happened before, all of that's interconnected. And so for somebody who is teetering on the edge of adopting a transgender identity, you know, I think one of the things that you can just do for them is care for these other areas in their life. If they're lonely, be a friend. If they just don't feel like they have anybody to talk to, be a listening ear. You don't have to say hardly anything, right? Like why does counseling work for people? So often it's not anything the counselor says. It's just because the counselor sits there and listens. And so many people in our world just don't have a friend that listens to them, right? How much good could we do in our world if we were quick to listen and slow to speak to everybody around us, right? I mean, why are good listeners often inundated with people that want to be their friends? Because they're good listeners, you know? When you are with somebody that genuinely cares about you as a person, you gain from that, you know? And so if you can be just a person in that other person's life and that you just genuinely care for them beyond the gender, you might begin to see a a renovation in their life from the inside out because these deeper needs are being met and, and ultimately trying to, at those points, fill them up with gospel truth and truth built on the Bible and of Christ, because that will be what satisfies them and and takes care of that confusion from the ground up. We just don't have that understanding of a transgender individual, because like we said in episode one, what are all the dominoes that have led us to the iceberg beneath the surface? Your truest self is inside of you. It's your gender. It's your sexuality, right? Well, I would challenge that paradigm to say beneath the iceberg of gender identity is actually other mental health and social struggles. And if we can help people in just really simple ways, and then and when that hearing to the design of God and to the design of scripture, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, then I think you can begin to see fruit. It's the long haul. You can't expect this to be, well, in, in two months of talking to them, they're going to be entirely better. No, this is the long haul with these individuals because so often these are year-long struggles that they have been ruminating on and struggling with, and it's not going to be an overnight process. So be patient. I, I heard a Puritan say, in some of my reading, a Puritan wrote that through prayer and great pains through Jesus Christ, anything can be accomplished. And that's so true. Through prayer and great pains in Christ Jesus, anything can happen. And that's what we labor for in the life of somebody who's not a Christian. So if we're going to tackle this, we have to be ready to do the work and really invest. Yeah. Yeah. And just be there, you know, be there in the long haul. And chances are an individual that is struggling with their gender identity has maybe already hurt others or pushed others away, or maybe they haven't and others are scared and not sure. And they just don't know what to do with this person. So they kind of back off. And it's like, look, you are a Jude 22 and 23 firefighter. Like you, (laughs) when everybody's running out of that burning building, you run into that burning building, right? And you save others, snatching them out of this fire that's consuming them that they they might not even realize. And so we as Christians have the best reason to go run into that fire. And we should put ourselves as close as possible to those people and trust that the Lord can use that. I'm gonna put that on my resume, Jude 23 firefighter. Jude 22 I love that. All right, (laughs) right, so we got probably what I feel will be the most common unbelievers sort of, you know, if you don't have the basis, you easily go down that road. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about Christians who start to share 
shift to that. Yeah. And still, I mean, we have plenty of people who are, I'm a Christian. I just, you know, the homosexuality thing, I'm willing to go with that, right? Mm -hmm. We have churches flying rainbow flags right now. Yeah. I'm imagining we're going to get to the point where some churches that are not strong are going to shift too. Mm -hmm. Because we we see it, you know, we we see the shift. So now we've got Christians that are like, yeah, you know, you got to get with it. And maybe they go, you know what, Deuteronomy 22.5, like we talked about last week, that's old school. That's, we fulfilled Mm -hmm. that. You know, Jesus kind of talks about it, but you know, like Mm -hmm. we don't really have something super concrete. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with them? I think a really helpful paradigm that I work from often in my counseling comes from Mike Emlett, who's a fantastic author and counselor at CCEF. Mike Emlett says that every one of us as a Christian simultaneously inhabits this Venn diagram. Okay, so picture a Venn diagram of three circles in Mm -hmm. your head. Okay, circle number one is that we are a sinner. As a Christian, we still sin. And there will never be a point in our life when that is not true of us. Now, we can be sanctified and we can grow in holiness. But in every issue we face, we should ask the question, am I sinning in this issue? Okay. So circle number one, we are sinners. Circle number two, we are also sufferers. So we might not actively be sinning in something that is is weighing on us and weighing on our hearts and minds and lives. We certainly can be suffering by our own weakness and our own frailty. You know, maybe just we just are struggling so much with this mental burden on who we are as, as an individual. And we just feel so uncomfortable in our own skin. Okay, that's legitimate human suffering. And the Bible can speak to that with kindness and compassion. So someone who is coming to us as a Christian and saying, I'm struggling with this, okay? Immediately when somebody, you know, gives us such a, uh, you know, just a heavy disclosure as like, I'm struggling with feeling like I'm a transgender individual, our heart rate jumps and we tense up and we immediately might be jumping to that sin Venn diagram circle. But I think we should, as Jude says, have mercy on those who are struggling and wavering. Okay, we should move our first instinct over there to the suffering circle and say, okay, this Christian brother or sister of mine is suffering because our world is broken and our sin nature presses in on us and I am not immune from that and neither are they. And my sin nature warps my own conception of myself, and so does theirs. And though I might feel comfortable and confident in the gender God made me, they might not, okay? And that is not a sign of their active sinning, but perhaps a way that sin in the brokenness of our world is pressing in on them, right? Yeah, it's like John the Baptist when he randomly asks if Jesus is the Christ, and you're like, wait, what? what where did that come from Uh but he's been he's been put in jail and is about to be beheaded Mm. and you see him sort of through that suffering go "Ah, i don't know and he sends his messengers and jesus's response is he did just reassurance yes you know it's like hey and then he goes into the thing about john the baptist being the greatest yes so jesus made that distinction between Mm. suffering and sinning in that venn diagram you can golden rule this right through the words of jesus like treat others the way that you would want somebody to treat you so if you as a christian are just really struggling with an area of just personal weakness and just an area of sanctification that you just feel like you're not able to experience like god's transforming work in your life quite yet how would you want somebody to handle you coming to them with that burden yeah with care and kindness hey thank you so much i like i know that has been weighing on you and i'm sure it takes a lot of guts for you to even get those words out yeah. you know and i and i'm honored that you would consider me worthy to to know this about you because this is something that i can tell just very much weighs on you that's the disposition we have and should have towards a fellow brother or sister in christ who is not actively sinning but suffering right so yeah. sinner sufferer and then the third venn diagram circle that we all inhabit as christians is that of a saint okay We are called saints. We are called holy. We are justified and sanctified and purified by Christ the moment that we believe. And so where somebody who is struggling and dejected and feeling defeated, where you can help them as a a sufferer, you can also encourage them as a saint and say, even though you don't feel like it, the Lord considers you as holy in Christ. And the Lord considers you as a new creation in him. And though you might feel like a sinner or a sufferer, you are also a saint. And you have a place of belonging among the people of God, both in this life and in eternal life, right? And so you can see how when we uh, have a fuller picture of a brother or sister through sin, suffering, saint, we can help somebody that's struggling with gender identity in multiple avenues. And if that person is going from the suffering circle to the sinning circle and saying, you know, I really think this is me. 
and I'm gonna start to explore this. And I'm, you know, I really feel like I'm gonna adopt this transgender identity. I think that's where we very lovingly call them back in repentance. And we say, hey, look, I understand this is a weighty issue on your heart and mind, and you are suffering with this. But the bright red line that God does not want you to cross for your good, for your emotional and physical good, is for you to not go there, right? Don't don't drive your car off this cliff. Because once you go off that cliff, there's no going back. And there's only hurt on the other side of it, you know? And God sees that. And that's why he puts those guardrails up for us. You know, you can see, like, you can call someone back from the edge of being a sinner back into the, hey, look, do not act on this. Let's handle the suffering that's going on here. Let's try to address that with the word of God and some helpful ideas and expand your thinking about yourself and correct some thinking about yourself. And always remember that on your worst days, you are a saint in the eyes of the Lord who loves you dearly as one of his sons or daughters. You know, that is that fully orbed care that we can sort of extend a fellow Christian who's suffering in these ways. And you don't have to have a master's in psychology for that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like God has given us the spirit and hopefully the other one, the other person we're talking to has the spirit as well. And if the spirit's working through me and the spirit's working through them, I, I tell others when it comes to evangelism, we can never discount what the Holy Spirit is doing on the other side of that equation, right? Yeah. We could fumble our lines and flub the gospel and just fumble every single verse that comes out of our mouth, but the Holy Spirit is working on the other side. Praise God for that. Well, the same thing when dealing with somebody who is a brother or sister that we understand is struggling with gender identity. Hey, if I have the Spirit and they have the Spirit, then we can work with that, right? And we can labor through the difficult sin, suffering, muck and come out as saints on the other side that are more like form the image of Christ, you know, and, and that's our desire. So I'm going to keep up in the stakes on you because that's what we do. <laughs> Crack open a new... Uh, so now course. I want to look at it from our church's perspective. As a church, we still have a responsibility. So we'll start with the believer who's a part of our fellowship, okay. who then comes in and says, you know what, after thinking and doing some things, now I want to transition to the other side. Mm. How as a church do we handle that? As a church, we're informed by Hebrews chapter 13, which says that we submit ourselves to pastoral authority. Anybody who is a member of Forest Baptist Church or a you know like-minded church that uh, has a biblical view of membership and elders and authority and oversight in the church, we as Christians, when we sign on and say we seek to be a member of this fellowship, we are submitting ourselves to pastoral authority, okay? Now that is countercultural and offensive to our world around us, right? Yeah, Because what is bit. what is the world around us wanting to do? Cast off authority, because of the psychological, sexual, political self dominoes that we talked about in the first episode. Yeah, and even Pastor Tyler said recently, people who have an authority problem probably have a God problem Amen. as well. Yeah, and what Carl Truman says in his book on uh, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, he, he uses the term expressive individualism to sort of coin this idea that I must express my gender and sexual orientation, whatever. So he calls that expressive individualism, okay? Well, expressive individualism is antithetical to church membership because what is expressive individualism? Individualism. It is saying, well, I am the highest authority in my life and I define my life for myself and I ultimately am calling the shots, right? Well, when you enter into the fellowship of believers, number one, you're submitting yourself to the lordship of Jesus, right? right. So if you're a Christian and you're simply agreeing with everything that just came out of my mouth about I define myself, uh, that's a lordship of Jesus problem, okay? Yeah, that's yeah. the bigger problem here that you really need to, to lay out before the Lord is the call of Jesus on all of our lives is to take up our cross and follow him and die to ourselves, okay? So according to Jesus, living for God will sometimes feel like death. It will feel like the death of yourself that you are so convinced is truly you. Jesus says, you know what? Following me, might require that of you. Following Jesus might require that of somebody on the gender and sexual side of this equation, you know, according to the, the beliefs of our world. And so within the church, you are submitting yourself to the authority of the pastors who, if they are doing the eldering thing right, are following Jesus, right? Jesus is the head, the pastors exercise oversight and authority, and the church gladly submits. Now, the pastors exercise authority as shepherds. Well, how does a shepherd deal with sheep? Is he whacking them all the time with his staff? You know, is he <laughs> distressing them? I mean, Jesus looked out over the crowds. What did Matthew remark on about Jesus? It says, he looked out on them with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. If we are shepherding right as, as pastors in the, the church of God, then we are exercising our shepherding staff with care 
and restraint and with long suffering and with patience and knowing, look, if that person in our midst shows the slightest evidence of fruit and of repentance and of sanctification, then we celebrate that and we rejoice that the Holy Spirit just took that person one step back from the the ledge, right? Mm -hmm. And so pastors shepherd and shepherds are patient because sheep bite and sheep kick and sheep smell. And a good pastor is going to have a very patient approach with an individual in that way. Now, if an individual begins to become more settled in the sin of desiring to be a member of the opposite gender and transitioning, you know, then that really does have to go with the elders and they have to consider, okay, is this person, you know, can we call them a legitimate brother or sister in Christ if that is a sin issue that they are seeking not to repent of and reject and, and crucify the flesh? They're seeking to indulge it and, and move on. And But inevitably, there's a point where we have to remove them from fellowship you know, at and, a certain point. Yeah, and I think the pastor's and the elders that had the insight into that particular person, you know, they are going to know that issue better than you or I ever could from the outside, right? Yeah. And so trusting our excellent elders here at FBC, you know, we would trust them to handle it with great patience, but also great conviction and understanding. They know where the bright red lines are on this issue, yet they also understand we are burdened with brokenness, every single one of us in this church, yeah. right? And we put on our church faces and we pretend like everything's okay when sometimes it's not, Right. And so if we are all working together as church members who are seeking to put the flesh to death, to grow in sanctification, to ask each other for help, if the pastors are exercising patience and authority, willing to put their foot down when it needs to be put down and willing to exercise the oversight that they need to oversee, then we're honoring to the Lord in that way. And, And we can trust the headship then of Jesus over all of us to then be yeah. perfectly enacted, you know, on judgment day. And let's flip it to now unbelievers who come into the church. What do we as a church do with that? Well, I don't know if you know this, but we had Mormons walk into our Good Friday service. <laughs> oh, I don't know I where that. you were. <laughs> I told them we had a deacon for that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if they talked to you or not. That's pretty but, funny. But, you know, we have people come in who are, you know, all sorts of things, and yeah. they're welcome to be a part of the worship yeah. service because that's the whole point Absolutely. to some extent. Yeah. So what do, what do we do with them if they're yeah. already kind of crossed the barrier? Yeah. Look, if a transgender person who is fully transitioned comes into our church and sits at our church for 52 Sundays in a row every Sunday morning and sits in a Sunday school class next to us, makes no conflict or confrontation or sort of agitates where they are, they simply are here to sit and listen— we would Glory allow, to God. We would allow that, right? Yeah. Because, you know, 1 Corinthians, when, when Paul is talking about just order in the church and right practice in the church, Paul assumes in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, he assumes that non-believers will be present. And so the gathering of the people of God does not exclude anybody from the outside from coming and hearing and hopefully hearing the gospel and growing in a knowledge of who Jesus is and what the gospel is calling them to be. They could sit in our church for 10 years in a row, you know, and (laughs) were they not to cause any sort of issue at all? I think we would allow it. Now, you say, okay, well, how would I address them in Sunday school? How would I would Yeah, that was my next question. Look, I think you just build a genuine relationship with them. And if it ever comes to the point where you ask them, like, did you have a prior name? Like, do you prefer to be, you know, use these pronouns or whatever? They might say, you know, I'd prefer you use feminine pronouns, even though I'm a biological male. And if they say, hey, yeah, I understand, but I also understand you're a Christian and I'm okay if you just use male pronouns. I don't take it, you know, as any sort of offense against myself. There you have it. Like, they're okay with it. You're okay with it, right? But if that person is more staunchly like, no, you must refer to me as my feminine pronouns, even though I'm a male. Okay, well, that's where we sort of go back to last episode where we say, right, we are not, we are seeking to not lie before the Lord. (laughs) Right, right. And that takes precedence, right? And if that is the straw that broke the camel's back to drive somebody away from the fellowship of a church, sadly, so be it. Because the people of God, the gathering of the church is for the people of God. And the preaching and the teaching is for us as Christians. And a non-Christian is welcome to sit and hear and listen and perhaps be exposed to the work of the Spirit through the Word doing its work. But if something like the correct or incorrect use of pronouns is what drives them away, in their heart and mind, they're convinced that that's a a hill to want to die on. And, you know, as Christians, we say, well, unfortunately, so be it. I mean, we're we're not going to sin against the God of the universe and our conscience. And clearly, the underlying motivation, or at least one of the underlying motivations of that in individual being in our gathering is to find some sort of affirmation in their transgender identity, right? Because if that 
issue is so important to them that they would leave over it, then very clearly the flip side is also true. Yeah. The affirmation would keep them, right? You know, that's one of those issues that we seek not to compromise on. And from their side, hey, look, if, if that is the terms of our friendship or your engagement in our church, then that's your decision, you know? And nobody is at all upset that you're here, but I wouldn't walk into a pride parade and expect everybody to agree with me there either, right? right you right, know, right. so the converse is also true, you know? And so again, I think if we're all being adults about this and understanding, right. not just because somebody doesn't agree with you doesn't mean they hate you or discriminatory against you. You know, even that spirit, if it's extended across relationships, can yeah. be something that at least keeps the the person maybe closer to hearing the truth of the gospel and then coming to a right knowledge of Jesus in the process. Let God be true and every man a liar. Mm, amen. I'm going to raise the bar one more time on you. Oh, boy. Not only are we Christians, but some of us are parents, mm. including yourself. Mm -hmm. As someone who works with the youth in youth, we're kind of the bridge in some ways between the parents and the youth. We come on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and we try to pour into them and emphasize what the parents are you know, saying by bringing them and all that. I feel for parents, mm -hmm. truly, with a generation where we're fighting everything that they can see elsewhere. Mm. And inevitably, there's going to be kids that do sort of go, well, I'm curious. And I've had people come to me and ask just generally mm -hmm. questions like, what do you think about this? And, and the questions yeah. I'm peppering you with, I've heard. I, I've asked Pastor Tyler previously, like when we did pepper the pastor last year, what happens if your kid is a part of a same-sex marriage. Do you go? Mm. Do you not go? Those are things we've had to navigate, and we're going to get to the point where parents are going to have to navigate, mm. okay, my kid's talking reassignment surgery. Mm -hmm. He's talking, you know, I want to be called a woman now. Mm. As a parent, how do we navigate that? Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> that is as clear as I can say it. If your child comes to you and says, I feel like I am this, and I want to be affirmed in this, do not do it as a parent. That is, I can't tell you how many books that I have read. And you can look at my bookshelf right there. How many yeah, there's a lot right there. I'm how many books at them, are on yeah. that bottom bookshelf, right? I have read so many books from theologians, from psychologists, from cultural individuals, from people on both sides of this argument. I cannot tell you how important it is that you don't give in. What your child is signing on to is so much darker and more sinister than they even know. They see, like we talked about previously, like they see all over social media, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm my true authentic self. I'm living my truth, right? And they don't see the regret. They don't see the depression. They don't see the 20 times national average suicide rate on the yeah, other side Yeah, I'm of that still cliff. trying to get over that stat. You know, and you as the parent are the God-given emergency break for your kid in certain situations. As much as we seek to raise our kids to be autonomous, functional adults and in their teen years begin making decisions for themselves that we trust are influenced by our input and godly wisdom. At the same time, when we see our kid running out in the street, we go grab them and pull them out from the middle of the road before a car hits them. Yeah. Well, this could not, the stakes could not be higher for teenagers. Absolutely. The teenagers being completely just sold a false bill of goods. And I think that's what, again, I want to be compassionate towards individuals that are struggling, but I also am righteously angry at the LGBTQ plus lobby and influencers and just the information that gets spoon fed to these teenagers with extra sugar and honey and syrup all over it, that this is the greatest thing ever. And knowing the dark side of all this, I just want to scream like, yeah. you are killing these kids. Yeah. You know, it is so sad. You are forever altering their bodies, their biology. Starting in kindergarten now. Yeah. I mean, it's so young too. The neurological makeup of their brains, the, the arteries that flow through their bodies, like all of this is just absolutely choked out and starved by everything that gets put into these teenagers' bodies when they begin to transition, they begin to have surgery, they begin to take hormones. It, you you are unwittingly condemning them to an early grave. You know, it's so sad, but I can't say it any clearer than that. We have to understand how high the stakes are for however strongly they feel about them having this maybe new identity. However much they might feel like there's payoff, the pitfalls are infinitely worse. It is so tragic that we are allowing and celebrating this without any hesitation or pause, warning label like we talked about. Yeah. There's just none of that, you know, and, and we as parents and, you know, pastors and leaders and, and those that have influence in a teenager's life, you know, we say you are a teenager. You're not seeing this clearly. 
<laughs> just right. wait, you right. know, 90% after age 25 will grow out of it. Like just don't do anything. Don't make any sudden yeah. movements and just, you will slowly but surely work through this. Don't commit to anything long-term, you know, absolutely seek out a Christian counselor for that child, get the professional help. That's not going to affirm them, yeah, but that's going to guide them away and show them the dangers of this choice the goodness of God's design and just inundate their lives with that. It's going to require radical intervention. It's going to require the parent to be the bad guy. Inevitably, if a parent puts their foot down and says, I'm not going to let you go through with this. Well, what's the parent's fear? The kid's going to run away. They're going to reject me. You know, they're going to go off and do something terrible with it. So the parents get so nervous, right? Studies have shown if you take their phone away, if you don't let them have access to screens, internet, YouTube, if you get them out living a balanced life of exercise, socializing, church attendance, anything to get them outside of their own head and out of their own phones, immediately those feelings begin to diminish. I read a story in Irresistible Damage, which was written by Abigail Schreier. Irresistible Damage, cannot recommend the book highly enough. Abigail Schreier, not a Christian, just a journalist um, with a a good pedigree of education. I think she went to uh, Princeton or, or something like that. Not a Christian, wrote this book called Irreversible Damage, How the Transgender Craze is Seducing Our Daughters. She, so she's aiming her sort of arguments at teenage girls. However, I think the application can be derived you know, to, to boys as well. Right. But Abigail Schreier tells a story in that book about parents who had their daughter come to them and say, I'm a boy. Here's my new name. Here's my new gender pronouns. You must affirm me in this. And she heard it all at school. She heard it on the internet. You know, right. She heard it from wherever, right? Mm-hmm. The parents that day put their house on the market, bought a ranch out west, transitioned to their jobs, their social life, their everything. They said, we're moving you right now. Phone gone, TV gone, internet gone. The daughter was, what, 13, 14 years old? Wow. They said, we're pulling you out. You're not going to be with these friends anymore. You're not going to be able to text them. You have no access to this. They moved their family out west, bought land. They just ranched and farmed, and their daughter got through it. And wow. she came out the other side. Well, why is that? Because it's just the the suffocating effect. Social pressure. Of social yeah. peer pressure. Yeah, it's um, massive. It's massive. Abigail Schreier in that book describes what she calls rapid onset gender dysphoria. Okay. R-O-G-D. Now, current medical literature only has gender dysphoria diagnosable. Okay. The only problem is gender dysphoria is typically early onset. So what I mean by early onset is you can typically spot a gender confused child as a child. So gender dysphoria is most is noticeable between the ages of three to five years old. A boy wants to play with dolls. A girl doesn't like having long hair. She doesn't want to wear dresses. You know, you can find the boy that doesn't fit in with the boy. So goes to plays with the girls. Those are signs of gender dysphoria that is observed in the early childhood years. Well, now people have kids that are perfectly normal up until they're 13, 14 years old. And all of a sudden they come home and say, oh, I'm this now. And the parents are like, you were not this five months ago. Right. And now you're this? Right. Well, the phenomenon is known as rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is not a childhood, mental, psychological, maladaptive development. It is a peer-influenced phenomenon. Right. And these girls get around other girls that feel insecure about their bodies. Well, this girl says she's trans. So then that girl says, I want to be trans too. And they all just become this together or they all have access to the same social media. You know, they're sharing the same videos and same reels and same TikToks. Right. And so any parent that has a child that is beginning to teeter on the edge, Mm -hmm. I 100% guarantee you that child has access to the internet, to social media and to friends that are promoting this in their buzz that's going in the ears. So pulling them out of that. That might be a short-term fight on your hands, but the long-term, yeah. like you are fighting for your child's future and the the other 60 plus years, Lord willing, that God will give them on the other side of adolescence, that's what you're fighting for, right? Yeah. You are fighting for a potential future family that they might have yeah. and keeping them from making a decision they might inevitably regret down the road, right? And so it sounds drastic, but intervention is the is the running into the burning building i mean you have to pull your child out of that environment and now that's going to take wisdom and it might not be i need to unenroll them from where they're you know they're getting their schooling or i need to yank their phone but you have to do something um to to show hey i know more than you you as a teenager me as an adult i know this is not going to end well for you and help a child get a grasp on that yeah. Um, and perhaps you will pull them from the fire as yeah. you know Abigail Schreier you know shared in, in her book there. 
Worst case, I do property management. I could get you some land in Wyoming if they, you really want yeah, it. Yeah, 100%. Really go the whole way. How much better would we do, man, if we put all of our screens <laughs> away and we just lived off the land? You know, That's there's, right. There's something, there's something good and, and wholesome about that. And thinking a little bit more nuanced, I remember being in high school and I remember, you know, hanging out with girls. Sometimes the girls thought it would be funny to like paint paint fingernails and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember a couple times just just because I wanted to get female attention, mm -hmm. I didn't have any ulterior motives. You know, I would do the fingernail painting thing. And I've seen guys do that where it's like, oh, I'm I'm trendy to the girls and things like that. And I remember my dad freaked out, you know, completely <laughs> yeah. freaked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I look back on it. And I'm like, yeah, I understand it. More of those nuanced things. Mm -hmm. As a parent yourself, yeah. how do you plan on handling more, maybe not overtly anything crazy yeah, yeah. like that? Yeah. yeah, I really do like the sin sufferer saint paradigm that we talked about earlier. The idea that, all of us as followers of Jesus with the Holy Spirit in us simultaneously experience life as sinners, sufferers, and saints. As a parent, I would just pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance to help me navigate that, to say, is my child confused? Are they rebellious? Are they seeking really to know what God says about something? Or are they trying to find a reason to cast off the authority of God and the word of God in their lives? You know, I think you as a parent very much can and should probe and just ask questions, always expressing your concerns and love and care for your teenager and saying, again, it's so countercultural and unpopular. But for a parent to say, I am your God-given authority in your life. I am here for your good and to help you. And if you trust me as the one who has raised you and provided for you and cared for you for all of these years, then I ask that you simply just listen here and hear me out and take what I am advising you very seriously. Because again, the world says, cast off any sort of authority around your gender and sexuality because that is true human living and flourishing where we would say, how are we defining what it is to be a human? Image bearers made you know, in the likeness of God, male and female, right? So we have a fundamentally different, truer, deeper, richer understanding of who our kid is in vertical relationship with the Lord. Yet we have to also acknowledge our kid is hearing voices from all over that's confusing that and trying to muddy that line. And so we try to help our kids see the vertical orientation of their life, that you have a relationship with the God of the universe who has created you male or you female and desires for you to live in accordance with that. And that is for your good and flourishing. And let me help you navigate some of these other voices you're hearing because there's a dark side to this that you as a teenager are probably not hearing and might not know about. And ask your kid, like, if you're willing, would you go talk to somebody about it? A pastor, a trusted friend that has maybe navigated this with their own, you know, friend or, or children and, and just seek help and, and surround yourself with others. Because as a parent, that burden will create crush you if you try to bear it alone. But the Lord has told us, bear one another's burdens, right? And and let me just say too, okay, I need to, I think, I need to speak a word of kindness and care to others that have had this before that may be experiencing regret that they didn't handle it correctly. The Lord is sovereign over all of our lives. The Lord is sovereign over the lives of our children. The Lord knows everything that we will do and not do in our parenting. The Lord knows when by his sovereignty, he will guide us to get it right. And by when our own weakness, we get it wrong. And no parent is perfect. And no parent will ever claim a perfect batting average. Any of us parents would admit to that. We do the best we can with the wisdom that God gives us and the knowledge we've gained from our years during our lives on earth. And for a lot of parents, you know, I'm 30 years old, but a lot of parents are older than me in our church and perhaps are a little bit more removed from the cultural phenomenon that you and I are experiencing as certainly millennials that grew up in this, yeah. you know, era. So a parent that is from Gen X or, you know, the baby boomer generation. Like I extend so much grace and patience with you because what a radically different world you're now living in than the world you grew up in. Like none of this was on any one of our parents' radars when they were a kid, teenager, college, when they were gaining an education. And all of a sudden this freight train is about ready to run over your kid, of course you're going to feel so disoriented. Of course you're going to be like, well, I love them and I, I don't want them to hurt themselves. And if they're threatening that they're going to hurt themselves, then, then I should not do anything to make them hate themselves. I think the Lord extends so much kindness and grace when we as parents have regret because he's sovereign right? And where there is regret in our lives where maybe we look back and we say, I wish that I had said something to my kid in that moment. And I take it upon myself that my kid is now where they are because I did or didn't do something. I think the Lord has so much grace and mercy for those parents because he knows, you know, he knows as our heavenly father, 
uh, our weaknesses. So for any parent, you know, who's struggling with that regret, I mean, lay it at the feet of the Lord and experience his, his patience and his tenderness because, you know, this is hard. This life is hard. And I think the Lord deals so patiently with us as parents. And so I, I hope that's a word of comfort as one that has been very, very closely impacted by this issue too. You know, I can't imagine the, the feeling of being the parent of a child that is caught in this, you know, and, uh, yeah, just knowing that the Lord gives grace and uh, and He forgives, and, and and that in some mysterious way it is His sovereign plan that your child is going through this right now. But it, Lord willing, might not be the end of the story. Yeah. The the prodigal son had to reach rock bottom. He right. had to be, he had to be face down in that muck before, <laughs> before the Bible says he came to his senses. He came to his senses. And that's what we pray for, for a, a child that we know, you know, or a friend that's caught. You know, we pray, God, if it's not me, let it be someone else. Help them come to their senses. And, and we rejoice, you know, we rejoice in the story of the prodigal son that the father will, will welcome that individual back with open arms. You know, I think that is the heart. That's the heart of God towards any parent, towards any child caught in this. And, uh, and we trust him with it. And we know that he is up to something. Um, that we might not see in that moment.